next, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go through some of the other lunar based designs that um, we're not able to present today. Again, we held this contest last year and there were quite a few really excellent presentations and or sorry, uh, submissions for the contest. If you go to our website and you go down to this lower area and have it scroll over, it says moon based design contest and click read more. You'll see all of the winners, as well as all of the other pre presentations uh, that were uh, submitted, all the other designs that were submitted. So we, we have already heard from DIA today. This was their winning design. Uh, lots of great renderings from that. And we also already heard from Carl Greenbaum today who, at the Hermes, Hermes Moon Base. Um, our third place winner was Argo Base. And this was from the Futurist Foundation. Uh, Naeem England and the team there. Um, so they had a really interesting design. Um, let me kind of scroll through some of the different elements of it. Um, you can see they're kind of using a lander similar to the Dynetics lander uh, on this rendering. And they had uh, a pretty detailed design of um, processing through all of the aspects of the base into this system here. Hydroponics was a huge part of their base. So you can see so that the hydroponics lab. There's an overhead view of the hydroponics lab. It's kind of showing you how big it is. It's filling up one whole dome on the base. And then here's another view. Those are the dynetic style landers um, getting unloaded by astronauts. One's taken off. It's a view of some of the operations outside. Building the base. So that was the third place winner, Argo Base. And again, all of their actual submissions you can read. So the whole entire PDF, the, each uh, contestant team sent in a 10 page research paper, uh, as well as renderings uh, if they wanted to. And so you could read all of those on our website. Um, I also want to highlight our honorable mention, which was Ellie, Ellie's Moon Base. Um, Ellie was a young lady that. Uh, actually did a physical model of her moon base uh, made out of marshmallows and uh, little wooden sticks. So uh, very cool. We uh, awarded her a free membership in the Moon Society as part of entering that base in our contest. One of the other uh, finalists was the Zor's moon base uh, by the InSpace team. Now they were very narrowly number four. Um, it was really close uh, bet between them and uh, the number three winner. So I, I definitely want to highlight their design as well. So that, as that loads up. And they had some pretty awesome renderings as well. But they're like a lot of the bases we saw, um, their base was located near Shackleton Crater. Seems like that's a very popular area to locate a moon base, as we all know, because of the water that is there. And their their base was spread over uh, a couple of uh, phases, preparatory mission and main mission. They would make use of the SpaceX Starship, like a lot of others would, because uh, it can deliver over 100 tons. And they talked, they, they made a little redesign of the cargo bay of the Starship to ensure that they could fit in all the, all the gear they needed. And their base was sort of a, you know, a long design like that, kind of used traditional Bigelow modules, um, inflatable modules as uh, the, the main element of the base. Those provide radiation shielding also because they've been well tested 
in space. They've been, uh, there's one dock to the International Space Station right now, as a matter of fact. They would also make use of some 3D printing to uh, glue some of the portions of the base together. And so here's some more renderings. See, they have, this is inside one of the Bigelow modules. They have some uh, uh, plant growth happening. I love all the poses they did uh, with their flight suits on. And they could really expand the space because the modules are repeatable. It's essentially a standard way to use a Bigelow style uh, module. So, so they did a great job. I just want to highlight Zora's team. Uh, they did really well with this. Very narrow, very hard decision uh, to judge this. Um, Nexus Aurora, which is an online community um, of space enthusiasts and advocates. They're doing a lot of great research on multiple fronts for both Moon and Mars. They had an entry called Prosperity Lunar Station. And there, it was essentially a three dome design. They actually had for, uh, that was for one of the two bases. They actually had two bases. They had a base uh, at, the, at the equator of the moon, Lunar Hab 1. And then they had a base near Shackleton, that's Lunar Hab 2. So this is a kind of a dual base system. And uh, the thought there was that it, they would use each location's respective advantages. So um, Lunar Hab 1 on the equator would be the primary base and the first base constructed. Uh, it's easier to get to. And then Lunar Base 2, Lunar Hab 2 would be smaller and it would be more of a research center with eight astronauts. Lunar Hab 1 would be more of the tourist destination. Lunar Hab 2 is more of the research destination. Um, they also made use of lava tubes, which is really interesting. So, um, you know, they would have, they would make use of some uh, uh, lava tubes as part of their overall site plan. So, Prosperity Base, that was a great design. Uh, we, we heard from Kent, that's his base in sight. Now this one was really interesting, okay? This one is called Moonstone Henge by Dr. Samir El Sayari. And you can see like, this is a very unique base design. He essentially made a bunch of towers and these are all constructed out of lunar materials. So let's dig into this one a little bit. Um, also his presentation uh, paper was very well designed too. Like I said, it was hard to judge this competition because everything, everything we received was so high quality. So this, this facility is built around Shackleton Crater, literally around it. And they wanted to unite the world through architecture by making a community-centered design. Uh, so, so Dr. Osari, his thought was, um, modifying the lunar landscape in different ways and have it be sort of based on different types of architectures that evoke famous earth structures. So the Notre Dame Cathedral, a traditional Chinese and Japanese tower, um, the Roman Colosseum, uh, the, and desert tents, the Arabian desert, so the way Bedouins live. So very interesting stuff. I mean, this was quite a quite an interesting base design. Um, you know, had a few deficiencies in terms of what we scored them on all the all the contestants. But uh, yeah, this one really, you know, for me was was highly interesting because of its uniqueness. So check that out for sure. And then a um, couple other ones, Project Shackleton was kind of more of a traditional, let's build a dome over Shackleton Crater. Could really mine it that way. Uh, Fakaris was using a kind of a honeycomb structure for their base. 
almost looks like a couple slinkies sitting there. Um, so anyway, uh, I just wanted to highlight those. A lot of really great learner-based designs we got and check those out. So what I'd like to do now is bring on everyone that's presented this morning. So if you guys would like to come on and um, turn your video on, it looks like we have uh, Carl and Kent and Victor still here. Um, I guess is, bring the DIA folks back in too. Let's see. Thank you guys all for participating in this panel. Um, I guess the first question I have, you've all now been, you're all veteran moon-based designers now, right? So what is your advice if, if someone was going to go do the work you did, if someone was going to uh, create a moon base, how, how do they get started? It's kind of a unique task, right? How, do, how would you do that? Anyone could chime in. Well, you know, I think, James, that we saw a, a remarkable diversity uh, of approaches, uh, some very, <clears throat> you know, I had a lot of technical details. Other people had a lot of, uh, uh, had a real sense of what kind of community you could create, things like that, which was also very important. Uh, so, it, you know, in a sense, you know, how you start depends on where you want to end up. I think that uh, if I had it to do over again, um, I think I'd probably spend more time uh, dealing with, you know, getting a better cost estimate and, uh, and getting a, a, a deeper sense of reality. Um, I mean, all of these were, were wonderful, but, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to know um, you know, I, I'm still skeptical of the way ahead. Uh, and so trying to design a base to do, to do what? Yeah, I mean, there's no one right way to do this. You know, um, I think we gave you guys criteria about, we want this to be an engineering focused design. We want it to be realistic. We want it to use current technology. Um, but like when someone goes to build a moon base for real, that may not be, always be the case. There may be some ulterior motive they have or some specific task they're trying to accomplish with the base. So any other thoughts folks have? Any uh, there, advice for a new moon base designer? There's, there's really two aspects to this. And I, my, my first involvement with the Mars Society was I won the Kepler Prize back in 2004. And I went from you know, being at the time a tech writer, you know, thinking, walking around thinking, gee, is this within my range or not? Because I used to design things when I was a kid, but I wasn't really, you know, an engineer or anything. And after a while, I realized my inner Calvin and Hobbes would never forgive me if I didn't at least try. So in the process of designing that, I realized that with space construction, you are crossing a line that no architect or artist has crossed in the history of humanity up until the last 50 years, which is that gravity is suddenly a variable. So things that you have taken for granted in design uh, are no longer, uh, you know, it's, it's like suddenly... It's like everybody has been walking around like this for you know 5,000 years and then suddenly you're the one who can take the eye off and, and go, oh, now I can see things from a different perspective. And once you do that, you can never go back. So the first thing you need to architect is yourself, is to be the one who can see things that way, um, which is why I'm still playing with this sort of thing after all these years, because it's just it's just such a beautiful mental exercise. Now, we are going from the Da Vinci's notebook, everything is a toy phase to actually wanting to do the real thing on, on the moon. Uh, that's going to require uh, people to understand the aspects of the history of technology and so forth and how one becomes a startup and how one gets ideas adopted and so forth and surround themselves with, with talented people whose talents are not in your zone. So. For example, you know, like you said, some is artistic, some is uh, is more engineering, some of it is more project management, some of it is more holistic. Uh, you need all of those things because you know my reactors are napkin sketches, but my you know other aspects of my things are more mature. Uh, other people they would do an elaborate reactor or an elaborate artistic approach. Um, all those things are are needed to make a workable, compatible 
compelling and beautiful design that humanity can be proud of. Any thoughts of Victor or Kunal? Um, yes. Um, I think we can learn a lot from uh, the remote outposts that we have uh, uh, developed for, for, for mines, for mines in the Andes, in the highlands or in the Arctic. Uh, all of them have the common uh, element of being practical, being modular, being perhaps modest in, in, in the uh, architecture, but practical. Uh, we need shelter, we need uh, comfort, we need heating or conditioned uh, uh, environment, and we need a, a good catering. So uh, we need all these spaces for, for, um, for uh, starting uh, uh, operations, working and resting enough until we develop a, a settlement that will become a small city or or, or something where everybody will, will be living and exchanging uh, uh, time or leisure time or, or uh, discussions and so on. But uh, the most important thing is that we are limited in the, the capacity of uh, the rockets and what we are bringing to the moon. So later we have to deal with uh, uh, things like uh, 3D printing and other, other ways, other means of of producing our own uh, construction elements. Um, and, and later we will find out that uh, gradually these uh, uh, this, uh, constructions, uh, and that's why it's important for them to be modular, will become from, from uh, temporary or pioneering to more permanent. And later also we will uh, welcome uh, visitors, have uh, panoramic windows, platforms for, uh, uh, um, uh, rockets and also for um, uh, telescopes, uh, as it was mentioned. And, and I think I like the idea of the two bases, one is the equator, which it would be more touristic and, and perhaps more uh, the one that faces the, the earth and the other, uh, the South Pole, where the operations, the mining operations appear. So I think the suggestions are, are very good. Uh, but also to, to round up, I like the idea of evoke the cultural elements from the uh, uh, from civilization that uh, could be brought up to, to the moon as leave, leaving some milestones of uh, uh, humankind uh, culture and history. Thank you so much. And welcome, uh, Rishal. We just added Rishal to the panel as well from the DIA team, our winning uh, moon-based design. Um, the question is, uh, what advice would you guys have for someone that's going to design a moon base now that you've designed your own? Any thoughts? What we, when we discussed about things, uh, most, like, most important concern was the sustainability of its base once we have things set up, because we will be heavily dependent for resources on Earth. And uh, as opposed to the ISS, Recover, like resupply missions to the moon will be very expensive and also much more challenging compared to just sending it on ISS. So I think we need to think more also about the, like how do you sustain the base? Because now if you can see we are at a stage where getting to the moon is no more a critical challenge. We are sure that we will reach the surface, but then what once you do, how do you sustain it for a long time? Because if we say a long-term base, if you want to get into anything like production of propellants, or if even if you want to start prospecting the lunar surface, we need a long-term solution for resources. And I think that is a major point of concern right now in terms of moon, uh, because we can get there. Do you have anything to add, Rishal? Yeah, okay. So one more concern with the lunar settlement that we thought about was radiation. Like, uh, we know long term radiation can affect and we only have a data of around astronauts staying in space for an year uh, on ISS. So if you're thinking of putting man and making him stay for say more than one year, say like five years or something. Uh, we can slow down the radiation for sure using the regolith layers or some uh, things, some insulating things that can slow down, but uh, still they will be facing uh, heavy doses of radiation and during also during EVS because 
that could be one more factor. So we are trying to find mitigate that problem currently. Thank you. Question for everyone. Um, was there something you saw in someone else's design that you thought was really interesting? I am uh, like really like the helio stat uh, for bringing in the light. I think it it will be very nice because having natural light is also important for sustaining long long term days anywhere. So I think that was a pretty good idea. Uh, there was a lot of just beautiful, uh, both engineering and and artistic. Uh, work across the board. And uh, the thing about these competitions, I, I've been watching it from both as a participant and as a, as a judge on occasion uh, over the last 15 years. And just the quality of work has just gone through the roof uh, because you'll have these university teams with 20 people or whatever, you know, all with the latest cutting edge tools and, and 3D printers and so forth. And, you know, you know, guys like me can't compete like they used to, but uh, it does mean that you know no no disrespect to uh, to the engineers on the, on the call, but who did amazing work and, and placed better than I did. But um, it's it's getting to the point where it's it's becoming democratized and it's becoming taken seriously. So uh, I think a lot of these designs just have I, I I could not enumerate every little thing I found amazing in this competition for, and this is a much smaller competition than some of the others. Um, so it's it's not amateur hour like it used to be. Um, yeah, well well said, this was not amateur hour by any means. Any other th thoughts you guys had for a design, a feature in someone else's design that you thought was really interesting? Um, I, 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 I was, uh, Thinking on the uh, tilapia fish tanks, <laughs> I mean that's a very very good idea, and uh, it's one of my favorite uh, dishes. And uh, and that's mm -hmm. one only the only source, but food would be one of the main concerns. So anything with uh, greenhouses and uh, self-grown uh, plants and and other uh, type of food li 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 uh, living. Uh, animals that we can have will will do great and will bring this sort of comfort that people needs the psychological part of the of the uh a, of of the camps uh, is important because people will be in cycles in where they they may miss the earth and, and their uh, families or so if they don't bring anyone uh, or uh, in any case, also going back to normal gravity. <laughs> so uh, cycles of perhaps no longer than two months for for every person would be kind of a, a, a acceptable as as it happens in the uh, in the Andes or or perhaps in the Arctic. Yes. Yeah, I really enjoyed and appreciated the design element of the magnetic track that would allow you to adjust gravity uh, to higher levels than exist on the moon. Uh, that remains one of the, the, the human challenges of living. And, you know, it, we understand people can live, for, you know, people have been up in the ISS for 20 years, not the same person, but, uh, and, and yet there are non-trivial biological changes that happen. And so long-term, uh, habitation on the lunar surface at 16 G uh, is not a slam dunk. Uh, I, when I was doing the, uh, I did a, a piece for the, for a different uh, conference. I did a poster on uh, just the, the hydropon, the aquaponics, and you know one of the knowledge gaps that I cited was, how will the fish thrive in one sixth gravity? Will they be, you know, will they be able to reproduce? Uh, and the same applies to people. Yeah, going going back to the food thing, and oh, by the way, if you are raising tilapia or, or cooking them, slice a banana and put it on top. It's delicious. But uh, I grew up on a farm in the Midwest, and my girlfriend is Filipina, and she grew up on a farm in Philippines. 
And it's interesting what is common and what is what is different between the two, because with her, it was coconuts and things like that. So one thing I would love to have is, and the nice thing about having four greenhouses in my design is four completely different climates uh, for diversity of, of taste in, in food. And then this goes right back to the epigenetic um, studies of what, what works, what doesn't work. And what we'll probably have in the long run is this odd little you know, hybrid of uh, biological and, and consequently food choices going forward, including uh, local adaptations that were not possible on earth and that will eventually be a, an export industry probably from space is, hey, coffee grown at 1.6G is completely different. Try it, you know. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of people like Hawaiian coffee because of the volcanic soil. I can imagine, mm -hmm. you know, I can't imagine what, space coffee is going to be like, for example. Um, yeah, and Sean Moss has a comment, you know, controlled environment agri agriculture, like that's a real huge topic that we have to go figure out. Um, I'm curious, what would you guys add to your design if you were able to redo it? Or what would you, you know, change or subtract from your design if you're able to redo it now? I think for us, uh, we would also try and focus more on the governance and management system because technologically, yes, it's important and we would be there. But then having a sustained international collaboration for a lunar base is also very important because without that, nothing's happening. Uh, not just like economic, but also like the technological uh, I would say transfer of knowledge between like across the countries to help each other so gain that. I think James mentioned in the design, like during the presentation about a polycentric system that will come up, but that will be in, that will come into the picture once there is a base set up and there are different departments. But before that, uh, sustaining through changing government is important because the governments will keep changing everywhere in different countries, it's not, it will not be, obviously the project will start by a major space agency, but then eventually it will be a collaboration of multiple agencies. So sustaining it through uh, around like 10 years, say for example, to, to set up set it up completely, will take a lot of time and effort and sustained collaboration would be very important for that to keep happening. Any other thoughts? What would you add or subtract or change with your design? Um, uh, James, go ahead, Victor. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I would uh, focus more on the uh, energy uh, generation and, and saving and recycling of everything that we produce or, 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 or generate. And uh, I think that that is an important thing that uh, we, we could find ways of of uh, utilizing or uh, maximizing the, the utilization of our resources for that. Uh, and, and the other is the, the way we grow, the modularity that could be external or in, internal in the sections of, of, the, uh, uh, of the infrastructure, such as uh, like a space station or, or something. How, how do we grow in what direction and for what purpose? Yeah, that would be it. Yeah, I started working on some more details of the thermal mining system, uh, including a specific designs for the RF system. Uh, and then I, then I discovered NASA's Break the Ice Lunar Challenge. And so that was a lot more work. <laughs> but uh, I did manage to put together a, a submittal for that that went in about a month ago. Um, it's you know, the notion of being able to uh, sublimate volatiles out of the lunar regolith without having to move the dirt around is very compelling. And uh, the real challenge is that based on the few samples of lunar regolith we've got back, they vary enormously in terms of uh, nanophase iron content and things like that, which have a, a, a strong a strong, uh, strong control over how much penetration you get, how much heating you get. Um, and so, you know, maybe the Viper mission will come back with some answers which help, but it's still, uh, it's still not a slam dunk. 
Yes, I'm looking very much forward to the science results of Viper to see what's going on with a lot of things on the volatile side. Uh, Kent, one, any thoughts one, for you? Yeah, just one minor thing. I, I going back to to Carl's point, I I deeply appreciate all the work you put in on the centering process because for a lot of it, we we a lot of us just read an article about it and go, oh, that's cool and we just throw it in our designs and move on but you've done enough of a deep dive on it that you're getting serious about it so if i can uh speak for if i can just put on james hat for just a moment and say please do a deep dive on that and uh give him information to put on the lunarpedia web part of the website uh because that is a really important thing to understand uh for not just your design but all designs going forward uh, that is that is really critical work to leave your fingerprint on the future. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, right now, I'm at about four days per kilometer, so <laughs> there's room for improvement. But yeah, well, I'll talk to James offline and see about what we can do about that. Yeah, Lunarpedia is our uh, wiki-based encyclopedia. Anyone can edit it, uh, and we're trying to build that out to be a great resource for lunar settlement. Um, question from Ben Smith, what dust mitigation strategies would your design employ, especially if it involves disturbing large amounts of regolith? It's a great question for the health of the astronauts. <clears throat> well, in my research, I found, I, I took the slide out in the interest of time, but uh, I found a paper by a NASA researcher, which just blew my mind, you know, that the the regolith, very fine, glassy uh, powder, electrostatically charged, sticks to everything. And this researcher created a, uh, a series of coils embedded in a piece of plastic. Uh, and he energized it with alternating currents. I don't remember the frequencies or whatever, but the test result, he's, and there's a matter of fact, there's a plot in the uh, in my paper. Uh, he took a 10 by 10 centimeter photo uh, uh, solar panel and had it cooking was going and, and over that was this this panel with all these coils in it. He sprinkled regolith simulant on it. This is in vacuum. They sprinkled regolith simulant on it until the solar panel uh, output dropped to about 20% of its initial level. And then he turned on the power to these coils. And in less than two seconds, it was back up to, I think it was like 98% of the original uh, solar panel thing. But opportunity could have really used one of those. <laughs> it's, it was just, you know, it was just one experiment. It's obviously, you know, a small scale, but the potential for uh, electrodiaphoresis, so just, you know, energizing these particles and getting to fly away uh, is, you know, sounds like it has a lot of potential. Yeah, a lot of it is just a matter of uh, if you're using the lunar dust as, as part of this, you know, sintering bag process, you're scrubbing it um, like a construction site. So it's, it, so within a kilometer of, of my base, it would probably be uh, scrub down to the bedrock. So you could do routine operations outside without so much dust and so forth. But uh, beyond that, when it comes to, you know, getting into other territories for exploration and so forth, then, then processes like Carl described would be, would be more accurate. Any other ideas or thoughts on dust mitigation? Uh, another aspect, like, obviously, we are also uh, like into looking towards the uh, like activities which need less requirement, less like excavation. So specifically like the material centering and everything, but uh, some processes, for example, the landing itself is going to cause a lot of dust to uh, be there in the atmosphere and you can't do much about it. So I uh, think it would be a optimized distance. The, land, the landing and launch site should be at an optimized distance from the base. So it's not far enough. Uh, yes, sorry, it's close enough so that you can get all the payload to the base, but it's not too far that you have to carry too much or like the distance shouldn't be too much for you to carry, but it should be far enough that it's safe. Uh, 
and like also from a safety perspective because landing and it's it's still a sensitive point and that's i think the, the most critical part of the phase like the soft landing on the lunar surface but uh, so yeah that and we can't do much about it as of now i'm considering any near term technology of landing without um, having lots of lunar dust in space but so the distance so that's how we also looked at it in our design the map so the launch site is located i think around uh, 1 or 2 kilometers from the base and then there will be unmanned rovers or different uh, robotics to carry all the payload for example if it starts if we have 100 tons of payload to carry so uh, that needs to be considered as well but then it shouldn't be too far that we need huge rovers itself to have it so i think there is a sweet compromise that needs to be made there but yeah lunar dust is still also like radiation and lunar dust are i think uh, good challenges to take care of at this point I also want to mention that submittal I made to the Break the Ice Challenge was titled Subdex. It stands for Sublimate, Don't Excavate. As you guys were thinking through your design, was there a particular aha moment for you that you something just crystallized for you and you're able to put it into your design? Um, since I'll give everybody else room to think here, I actually had to, I was trying to figure out how to do my roof design. So I ended up doing a geomag arrangement and I spent probably an hour tinkering with this before I came up with something that was workable. So if, if aspects of my thing look like toys, that's because they were fabricated on them. Anyone else? Um, yeah, Hi, Victor. I, I think the the aha moment in my uh, in our concept was uh, uh, our vantage point for appreciating the work that we're doing. Uh, perhaps the fascination or the awe that we can have uh, 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 seeing a, a huge crater in permanent darkness, or or see the the moon rising from one side or the other. If it's on the South Pole, would be kind of more, uh, kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, surrealistic. But uh, in any case, may may look more or less like like living in Alaska or or other other extreme uh, places. And the other is um, uh, being able to to uh, appreciate or or kind of visualize what 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 we can see. And and later, of course. Uh, uh, watching the watching the stars or or, or with telescopes or or just with the naked eye, I think would be uh, a special thing, very appealing and attractive for the the visitor. I think the aha moment for me was when I discovered this uh, inflatable habitat concept where you could could basically bulldoze the regolith over the bladder before you inflated it, uh, which would greatly simplify the, the construction. Um, and uh, and it, was a, it was in a paper, it was in a 1996 uh, lunar construction uh, paper that you know I was flipping through and uh, just one little sketch, you know, and a half a, and a small paragraph I thought, yeah, that'll work. I think the goofiest moment I had was uh, I was looking up the numbers for the radiators for that nuclear reactor. And I thought, well, these are for deep space. What's it going to do on the moon when you've got the ambient heat of the moon and everything and, and full daylight and you can't escape it with shade. And I was like, if it's full daylight, put a damn solar panel on it. Um, you know, and then use that to mitigate the the difference. So it was just one, that was probably the, it wasn't an aha moment so much as a duh moment, but yeah. About um, DIA team, any aha moments from you guys? Yeah, I would say for us, there were two aha moments kind of. So one was uh, while we were structuring the modules of our uh, of the base, uh, we figured we were planning like how we can make it safe 
uh, say for example, if there is an emergency uh, evacuation, uh, people should be able to get out of the base or that particular module immediately. And that's how we came up with this modular uh, arrangement. So each module or each room of that base is kind of independent of each other and can be, you know, in case of emergency, that particular module, which is facing the problem can be shut down from the rest of the other base and won't be affected in terms of power or anything else. And also people like uh, for every module, there is an exit point, like people can uh, directly step out uh, outside the entire base structure onto the um, lunar surface. So that was kind of a aha moment that, uh, I mean, we were happy that we have some uh, safety plans. Uh, and second part was we are having a kind of cupola structure. So we because there are no windows inside for our base, um, we were kind of missing that beautiful lunar view and also viewing the Earth. So one of our team members came up with this idea that uh, we have an observing window on board ISS. Same way we can have some similar gallery or viewing port outside our base when people can stay uh, for a few moments. Uh, it will be shielded by thick glass to slow down the radiation. Uh, and also people can um, take a good look and have an overview effect. So yeah, we were pretty happy uh, for having those cup that cupola structure. Thank you. Another um, one. I, go ahead, go ahead, please. I mean, uh, though it was when like of, during the architectural planning of the base because uh, so we came up with uh, the toroidal structure like from a very engineering perspective and everything else but while developing the technical support lens we had our aha moment where the finally everything lined up properly and we uh, like we could decide the base itself the technical floor plan was made in a way which was also aligned with our construction timeline. So it, it was not as if like we had to change anything for that. And when everything just lined up, it was like, that was our moment, like everything is okay and aligned and this works and we can proceed with that. Because that technical floor plan was a pain for us to come up with solutions without problems. Like every floor plan had some problem. Oh, no, we can't do this. We can place it here. Uh, there's a problem. We can't have the crew sleeping here. We can't have the, uh, community models here. So that line, lining that up was also a major task. I see. Okay, uh, let's let's move away from the hardware for a second. Um, if, you, if we assume that your base is built, okay, and it's operating on the moon surface, how would you talk to the people back on Earth about governing and legal aspects. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you guys are aware that there's really no legal framework for commercial bases on the moon at this moment. Um, we're all governed by the Outer Space Treaty and there are some things floating around like the Artemis Accords, but do you have any thoughts about how you would lobby Earth to make sure that there was a proper legal framework for things like property rights for mining and things like that? I, th I think one aspect would be to to essentially detach the the entity because I, you know, we're getting to the point where regulators are getting into a mercantilist attitude where they see people as not independent entities but as property of the state, and uh, so if like you're American and you move to another country, you may still be taxed in the United States. That's a, you know, that's kind of an interesting you know, one of the founding principles of the U.S. was that we were not property uh, in terms of the state as a whole. Uh, whereas in other cultures that, you know, if you bought a hundred acres of land and there was an indigenous village there, they became part of the property of the of the state. So I, I would like to set up an organization where you have a either an NGO or a corporation or something that is within the regulatory structure of whatever nation, whether it's US or Luxembourg or whatever, that does all that work, that works in conventional fiat currencies and so forth. But when it comes to the base itself, that is done on a separate channel. It's like a, it's almost like a, a, a like a glove box where you reach into the thing, but and you can touch things, but you can't, you're not physically coming in contact with that, with that entity, it becomes separate. So that if there is a regulatory change on earth, if there's a shift in government or so forth, you don't you know, 
destroy the uh, infrastructure going up to to a space settlement. You can simply change whoever's reaching in the glove box, but you're not uh, pulling it into that magisteria of the of the government entities. Because if space is for everybody, then it should not be for any one uh, entity, uh, you know, including the United Nations, uh, to be in charge of that uh, thing. Uh, I think it needs to be. We need to not assume that the entire universe is under our control um uh, yeah i i i have a, a just an a, an idea i i think i agree with what has been said and that it it, it has to be a like a a new entity uh, uh, that welcomes all the countries uh, in the same in the in equal in equal manner, the same way, and that this is a common or a new space where uh, a new a new place where uh, uh, production, industry, manufacturing, science, studies, and and leisure could uh, live together, and and that uh, people will will feel welcome. It could be a separate entity. Uh, I mean, I don't know if United Nations could could be something similar. Perhaps not. Not exactly like that, but some some new identity. And uh, I'll go one step beyond and say, what will happen if uh, uh, children start to be born <laughs> on the moon and they will create their own identity? And there's really nice stories of people born on the moon or born in Mars that also will have their own perception of the earth as like a remote place. And, 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 and that will create also new rights and new feelings of... Uh, uh, I mean, this is my my uh, uh, hometown, and 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 they will have a, a different perception of, of that. So they would like to welcome people from the earth and have them in a in a kind of a again the can the concept of Epcot Center may may arise a, like a sort of a all nations and and one world or something or a second world, second earth or or a home. Uh, away from home, uh, all these uh, uh, cliches may may work very well for feeling, uh, uh, making people feeling comfortable in in this new environment. Um, I'll just like to add uh, that I mean, uh, what we were thinking is uh, we kind of have a structure which will be there on the Earth as well as on the lunar settlement to look after the activities, uh, all the management stuff. Uh, so most of the regulatory decisions will be taken by the management that is there, uh, going to be there on Earth. And uh, if there are certain problems that would be arising on the base, either the base can directly contact to the ground control, um, or there will be also a kind of uh, uh, a manager or a leader who will look after the activities, day-to-day -day activities, uh, and of course the polycentric government sort of thing. Uh, and another thing would be, uh, we were thinking about not having a sovereign nation, like a sovereignty or declaring the moon society as a completely different set and having its own flag because that can become a, an area of conflict. Uh, there are certain international uh, space policies and lunar agreements that are done and it says that no one can own the land and something like that so uh, we were thinking like uh, the moon base can have its own society and have its own different culture but it can't just uh, declare its own sovereign nation or can have its flag so they will still be called earth people um, unless they are not going to be, stay there lifelong like they will be on the mission uh, but yeah, of course, I mean, they will be standing out from the people uh, as that of Earth. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. We're out of time. Uh, thank you so much for participating in our panel today and for presenting today at our conference. We really appreciate it. And uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.